Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. I've roamed and rambled, and I've followed my footsteps to the sparkling sands of her diamond deserts. And all around me, a voice was sounding. This land was made for you and me. There was a time when the pagodas at most Scotch whiskey distilleries served a functional purpose back when most distillers still malted their own barley using traditional malting floors. Today, you can count the number of distilleries still using floor maltings on the fingers of both hands and have a couple of fingers left over. Floor maltings were never very efficient compared to the giant drums commercial maltsters use, but a few distilleries still believe they make a difference even if the malting floor only supplies some of their barley. If you were looking at it from purely economic grounds, you, would, you wouldn't do it. Floor maltings, the way we do it and the way all the other distillers do it that still have a floor maltings, it's more expensive. It's more expensive than buying it in. Um, so you have to really believe and commit to the fact that it gives your product some difference, um, some valuable difference in your new make spirit and and it does um, I genuinely believe that what we do makes a difference in our final product Highland Park wouldn't be Highland Park the way you know it and everybody loves it if we didn't have that Marie Stanton has worked at two distilleries with floor maltings first at the Balveni in Speyside in 2016 she moved to Orkney to become the manager at Highland Park it's just really interesting. I mean, I'm not a maltster um, by any stretch of the imagination. I'm te technically, I'm a brewer, but um, maltings is, is very interesting. Um, and again, the, sort of the science and the art and all that, um, particularly with the floor maltings. The floor maltings is, is, is different. Barley comes in from the mainland or from local Orkney farmers. It's steeped in water to start the germination process. Go for it. No one's quite sure just how old this chariot is, but the malting barn is at least 100 years old. This is a new barn here, which is just a just a hundred years old. Yeah. Paul Manson's pushing the chariot while maltman Derek Linkletter breaks out the barley. It's his job to oversee the malting floors. So what's the harder job, pushing that thing or, push, or moving the barrel of barley? Probably, probably this, yeah. Because I thought it looks old fashioned, the chariot, it, the, it's pretty good. I mean, you don't, it, it's no any heavier to push empty or full, you can. No. It takes about 60 chariot loads to fill the floor with wet barley, and it's all done by hand. It's just the old, the old fashioned way, it's just traditional, I suppose. There's only five or six distilleries in Scotland that does it this way. Authentic. Just do it the hard way, right? Yes. Yeah. Keeps you fit. There are no automated temperature probes here, just a bunch of thermometers placed around the malting floor. The warmer the grain is, the more often it'll have to be turned. Once it's been on the floor for a few days, it gets stronger, I think, the smell. Depending on the season, it takes five to seven days for the barley to germinate as sprouts begin to shoot out from the wet grain. If you leave it alone for that long, though, the grain on the bottom can get moldy or sprout too fast. Several times a day, a member of the malting team comes in to turn the malt. Alan Yunsen can do the entire floor in 20 minutes with this machine when it's working. 
And when the machine's not working, it's back to the old-fashioned way of turning malt by hand. If you if you did this every day, yeah, you would end up with uh, what they call monkey shoulder. It's hard on the shoulders. It's hard on the elbows. It's quite a hard job. But you'd have a few if you're doing it. It wouldn't just be yourself. You'd have a team of two or three people doing it. If Alan had to do this entire floor by himself, it would take about three hours. And then on to the next floor. The more it roots, the more it germinates, the less sugars. You lost some of the sugars. So it goes into the roots. The, 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 you want to contain the sugar in the roots, in the barley itself. So the more roots that grow, the less sugars that you're going to keep in the barley. So you don't want it to overshoot. It's got to be fairly precise, to be honest. So it is a fairly strict. They the look, the look at it fairly, fairly diligently. Even with diligent monitoring, floor maltings don't produce the same consistency as commercial drum maltings, but that's part of the charm. It's nice to be traditional. It's nice to be one of the few that are still doing this. A lot of people come up here and to us, and they're just, they just love seeing the malting floors. They think it's such a... It's such a nice thing to see because there's a lot of a lot of distilleries that still do the malting floors, you don't get access to that on your tours. So it does it gives a nice insight as to what we do here. There's no secrets. I mean it's just it's a basic there's not two different ways to make whiskey to be honest. There's slight variations that you may do here and there, but it's all the same end product. Highland Park malts about twenty percent of its own barley. The rest comes from commercial maltings on the Scottish mainland. But that 20% is one of the variations that makes Highland Park unique. It's peated. And it's the only barley that uses peat from Orkney's Hobbister Moor, where the high winds coming off Scapa Flow keep the vegetation low to the ground. These peat chunks may look like the ones from bogs on Isla and the mainland, but they're completely different. There are four main sort of peat bog types, so there's um Aberdeenshire and sort of St Fergus is what a lot of people call it. Then there's Tom and Tal peat up on the Cairngorm Plateau. There's Isla peat, obviously, um, and then there's Orkney peat. Um, and each one of those peat types gives you very different character in your sort of phenolic profile. Um, and Orkney peat is different because it's a lot softer. Some of the phenolic compounds that come through um, are different, nowhere near the sort of medicinally type ones you often get from Isla peat. And that's to do with what your peat's made up of, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the reeds and the grasses and the scrub and whether it's gorse or here, it's nearly, you know, all heather. Um, and, and so that contributes to the, the layers of the peat and, and then that contributes to the phenols that come off it when you actually burn it in the kiln. It's fascinating stuff, absolutely fascinating. Graham Garrick knows his peat. <laughs> Part of his job is to keep the fires burning. Yeah, what in the smoke, which we call the reek, which you see now, you want it to go up and it clings on to the wet malt that we've just loaded this morning. And that's what gives you your flavour, phenols. Like barbecue, low and slow. So ideally you want to, you're not looking for heat with the peat. You're just wanting to get the reek, the phenols. And then when it goes on to coat, that gives you the heat to dry it out to a moisture of 5% and under before we can take the fire off. Depending on the weather, the barley gets that peaty smoke for about 20 hours. And it's not just the barley that gets that peaty aroma. When the wind is right, smoke from the two kilns blankets the area. Walking up from the house. You do, in, in, in Britain, people recognize the thing of the Bisto kids. It was, a, it was an old gravy advert and these two little children were playing out and then the cloud of the smell of the gravy and they had two little upturned noses and they went so when I come in I feel like a bisto kid I'm like 
and following the smell and sometimes you can smell them mashing before you even get in the door and you can smell the peat and you can smell the smoke so it's all about the smells of the place and it really sets a distillery that does its own floor moldings apart yes you don't get that yeah out of the places no you, you don't get that same peaty smell but then some of the distilleries that do malt don't use as much peat as we do um you know, the last place I worked on, I used a very small amount of peat, so you didn't get that same big plume of smoke and aroma coming out of the pagoda. Um, but yeah, all, all, all good smells. It's nice to walk in the yard and, and know that things are happening because you can smell it before you ever even get to talk to anybody. You can smell it, so you know it's working. Once the peated malt is dry, it'll be mixed with 80% unpeated malt, milled, and turned into whiskey. While the guys on the malting floor work on the next batch of malt. For more cask strength conversation on whiskeys, with the people who make them and the people who drink them, join us each week for Whiskey Cast. In Kirkwall, Orkney, Scotland, I'm Mark Gillespie.